My name is David Heinemann and I'm a professor of communication studies at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania. In this video, I'm going to discuss a creative research project that I worked on last year entitled The Pandemic Nature Project, which eventually culminated in the creation of a 35-minute short film about my experiences during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. To better introduce you to the project, here's a snippet of the film's opening segment. In watching the news, it became increasingly clear that poor leadership and a strained healthcare system had led to an untenable situation, one that would get much worse before it would get better. All of this was scary. It was depressing. There had to be a better way to endure a lengthy pandemic. For millions of Americans, the key to enduring the pandemic was to escape to the great outdoors, to embrace the wide open spaces where fresh air was plentiful and social distancing was the norm. So the response was an unprecedented number of visitors flocking to campgrounds, forests, parks, and hiking trails. This exodus to the outdoors was especially true in Pennsylvania, where I live, and this was the same impulse that I felt when I tried to approach the pandemic as an opportunity to reignite my love of the outdoors. I spent a lot of time in the woods playing and exploring as a child. But thus far, I've spent comparatively precious little of my adulthood in those spaces. I'd always enjoyed the way that the forest lights up my senses. When I'm there, I can hear things better, or I notice smaller details in the landscape, or I enjoy the crunch of leaves under my feet, and I feel reconnected to something primal and pure. And so hiking seemed like the perfect antidote to the stillness and isolation that had been imposed by the pandemic. It could be a chance to unplug, a chance to escape. So with some new gear and a backpack full of high hopes, I set out to embark on new adventures in the wilderness, a place where I could shake off the dread of COVID. The clatter of the news feed and quarantine's heavy inertia. Out here, I could reconnect and relax. And it worked for a while. I found a measure of solace in nature, and I enjoyed a new sense of exploration and discovery as I hiked longer and longer trails, and I felt improvements in both my physical and mental health. But it was an uneasy escape. Turns out that one can't easily shut out a life-altering event like a global pandemic. And despite my best intentions, my mind increasingly turned to thoughts about the virus. And so my escape wasn't really an escape at all. Instead, Trips to the forest became a sort of strange lens through which I would come to think about the pandemic. A juxtaposition of nature's visible beauty against its invisible horrors. And the more I thought about these juxtapositions, the more I wanted to find ways to document them. And the more I thought about documenting them, the more creative inspiration the forest provided. So I set to work on this project. And much of the time, when I wasn't hiking, I was at home indulging some of my other interests. That includes writing, but also amateur photography and filmmaking. Playing analog synthesizers. Reading postmodern theory. And journaling. And so I used all of this to document what was going on in both my own life and the world during 2020, but to do so in a way that could more holistically capture my experiences than I could with just writing, film, or music alone. I decided to call it the Pandemic Nature Project. You're about to see 20 short vignettes that collectively capture much of how I experienced and thought about the year 2020. Together, I feel like they create a kind of impressionistic story, a sort of visual autoethnography that highlights a year defined by stark contrasts. The beauty of the nature around me against the horrors being caused by the virus, 
the chosen isolation found in the woods against the forced isolation of quarantine. The physical improvement from hours of hiking against the mental decline from hours of doom scrolling. I hope that in these 20 juxtapositions, you can find a place to situate your own pandemic experience. So that clip should give you a general sense of what the film is set up to do. And I'll show a few more from it here in a moment. But next, I want to talk a little bit about how I developed the idea for creating an autoethnographic film. So my academic scholarship has almost always focused on the application of rhetorical and critical theories to new media technologies. And it's often informed by postmodern and deconstructionist approaches to contemporary life. So I find that scholars like Paul Virilio, Stuart Hall, Judith Butler, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and others often provide theoretical concepts that explain the relationship of where, we're bit, where we've been to where we're going. And especially with their ideas when they're applied to media and used in media criticism, a lot of their work offers a useful understanding of the rhetorical underpinnings of contemporary communication. And so because of this, when the pandemic first hit in full force in March of 2020, I found the writing of scholars like uh, of folks like Jean Baudrillard especially useful for contemplating and contextualizing what I saw taking place globally and especially here in the United States. Baudrillard offers that American life is one that's best defined by movement and sprawl, hypocrisy and myth mediation and confusion. And Jean Baudrillard, after spending time touring and observing life in the United States in the late 20th century, determined that America could be understood only as a, quote, prodigious confusion of effects, a world of things and events that defies judgment. He found that due to both its sprawling geography and its increasingly mediated hyperreal modes of representation, the country always already resisted any kind of simple categorization. It was hard to get a fix on meaning in a culture that was constantly moving. An analysis of the country, he then implies, requires a perspective that develops while in motion. He said famously that you can drive 10,000 miles across America and you'll know more about the country than all the institutes of sociology and political science put together. So accordingly, any critical project that might attempt to come to terms with the discourses surrounding a significant public event such as the pandemic, while it unfolds, would require an approach that can poke at these dimensions of meaning while also deferring any kind of totalizing, fixed understanding of what that event might mean. So therefore, communication scholars interested in developing critical perspectives about an event while it unfolds must adopt research methodologies that foster an awareness of shifting perspectives and that attend to the polysemic nature of hyperreal public communication. Because of this is how I saw the pandemic and because I wanted to produce accessible and engaging scholarship about this event that met a wide range of audiences, both inside and outside of academia, I turned my attention to a method known as rhetorical autoethnography. Journal entry. The claims we make about the significance of a particular event or of a particular time period in history, such as the year 2020, are at best contingent, grounded in what we know at the time and what our present needs for those recollections are. Accordingly, our analysis comes after, from a removed perspective. Autoethnography is fascinating as a method in part because of its ability to try and do that kind of post-event analysis that most methods rely on, but in real time. This is why the visual and descriptive become so essential to good autoethnography. It must document why it made its claims. It's why I find especially creative or artistic autoethnography to be analytically provocative and critically productive. This also gives autoethnography practices a kind of impressionistic veneer, one that can be frustrating for a reader looking for the takeaway, but a nice place to stay and think for those who value a project that might create that space. And it is from this space that one might enter with empathy into the lives of others. So autoethnography is a method that's especially well suited to the sedimentation of critical concepts, concepts that can shape both perception of the self and analysis of the social and enrich the quality and rigor of qualitative research. More importantly, the multimediated and multimodal dimensions afforded to autoethnography can help to facilitate the circulation of critical insights and theoretical perspectives, not only across disciplines, but also across publics. And so in the film, I use this understanding of rhetorical autoethnography to track how my own critical perspectives on American life shifted, mutated, and otherwise transformed during the COVID-19 pandemic, and especially my attention to the rhetoric of public communication during this event. And I found that incorporating 
audiovisual and digital media into the autoethnographic practice and into my methodology was especially useful for emphasizing the tenuous relationships between the researcher, the critical and rhetorical insights that they might offer, and the confusing whirl of ongoing current events that Baudrillard describes. Specifically, the visual autoethnography is especially useful for highlighting the role of juxtapositions in contemporary meaning making. And the end of the film ultimately argues that a perspective developed through juxtaposition, a process similar to Kenneth Burke's notion of perspective by incongruity, is key for understanding the relationship between the pandemic and its natural and environmental causes. A cellular tower set ablaze. In one week, police responded to seven similar fires, all targeting cell towers. They've since arrested a couple in their 20s and are investigating whether they might have been motivated by a conspiracy theory linking 5G technology to COVID-19. One of the first to suggest the link was this Belgian doctor back in January in an interview with a local newspaper. Within 24 hours, the paper removed the story. But the spark of the conspiracy had been lit. The weeks that followed saw the claim repeated over and over on social media. 5G weakens the immune system, allowing COVID-19 to attack. Others, like this American doctor, claimed there is no virus at all, but rather that 5G is poisoning people's cells. It doesn't make any sense. Well, there is a lot we still don't know about COVID-19. Microbiologists have put the virus under the microscope. Dr. and Ellis have highlighted that autoethnography is, quote, an autobiographical genre of writing and research that displays multiple layers of consciousness connecting the personal to the cultural. Likewise, Evans and Blair tell us that autoethnography is a form of self-narrative that places the self within the social context and has the capacity to provoke viewers to broaden their horizons, reflect critically on experiences, and enter empathetically into the lives of others, and to actively participate in dialogue regarding the social implications of the encountered. Similarly, Polos has suggested that the effectiveness of an autoethnography is especially indebted to the participation of those who encounter it. He says, I send it out to you and you read it and something in you starts to change and together we create a call and response of writing and reading, listening and responding, writing and writing back, of co-authoring a new relational being. And so the work of autoethnography can take different forms, journaling, structured, structured documentation of experiences, systematic analysis of internal responses to external stimuli, free-form responsiveness to unfolding events, and the like. Visual rhetorical autoethnography, a method that allows for many conceptual, visual, or personal points of entry and departure within a single work, can invite just this kind of response from an audience. So these were the methodological underpinnings of this project, a film that is designed through autoethnography to foster empathy through the use of Burke's perspective by incongruity. The film, in fact, ends on this note, highlighting Burke's argument that the technique is especially useful, quote, for merging things which common sense has divided and dividing things which common sense has merged. And so while the film is academic in its design, it's also meant to reflect the potential for creative methodology to connect with interested publics. I have thus far enjoyed screening the Pandemic Nature Project at public film festivals, sharing it with students and other researchers at various universities, and otherwise talking about the value of a method that fosters the very mechanisms that the pandemic sometimes seem to rob us of, critical reflection, empathic identification with the perspective of others, and a recognition of the value of juxtaposition in moments of confusion and crisis. Anyone watching this can find out more about the film at the website linked here and in the description, and I'd be happy to further share my work with you if the opportunity arises. Thank you for your time, and enjoy the rest of the conference.